Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ryan Duquette, and I'm happy to be back uh, presenting again for my second time. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking of uh, managing your risks and the problem of passwords. I am the founder and a principal at Hexagen Consulting, and we are a digital investigation and cybersecurity firm uh, based in the greater Toronto area. Way back, uh, you know, when I was quite young, probably when I was six or so, um, I had a tree fort. And uh, my best friend and I used to hang out in that tree fort all the time. And we decided that the best way to protect that tree fort, to protect what was inside that tree fort, was to obviously have a rope ladder. And we would be the only two people that would have the password to get up into that tree fort. Um, and, and we thought that that was the best way, using, using a password. Um, so we would pull up the ladder and we would ask anybody who wanted to come up what the password was and they, they needed to know that. Um, however, my, my friend and I had a, a bit of a falling out or a fight, you know, little kids do that sort of thing on a daily basis, it seems. And he decided that the time to go and uh, give the password to our tree fort to the entire school. Um, so we had people coming in and saying the password now it was funny because I would just look down uh, from the tree fort and people were giving our passwords and, and I was mortified that you know this password was being shared around and it was potentially going to let, let people into our tree fort which didn't really happen but um, you know this whole concept of passwords made me think uh, back into my youth when, when we used to use passwords so you know nowadays we use passwords for for everything right especially in the digital realm on our computers and our systems and it, it's it's no secret that um, we're not very good at, at creating passwords and using them um, you know, you can see here on the slide that over the last, you know, six years, there two, not, there's not 2018 data here, but over the last six years or so, uh, you know, the most commonly used passwords haven't really changed that much over time. Uh, you know, obviously a password is still um, a very common commonly used password and you know one two three four five six or they'll throw some extra characters into there but uh, for the most part uh, the passwords have stayed the same over a long period of time and I don't see that changing anytime soon you know back in 2003 NIST came out with their um, you know recommendations for uh, password use um, and we all know these these recommendations, you know, eight characters at a minimum, they must have uppercase and lowercase letters with some numbers some special characters, we have to change those passwords every 90 days. The, the gentleman that actually came up with that standard has since now come out in public and said that he, he regrets, um, you know, much of what he did, he now regrets because it was based on, you know, a lack of knowledge um, at that time. And it was based on a lack of knowledge of where we were going to progress from 2003 moving forward. So, you know, something like this was obviously um, something that we used to see all the time. Time. And we still do see because even though the standards from NIST have changed, and we're going to get to those in a second, people are still using those old standards and organizations are still using those old standards as well. So the, the, you know, the, the, the boat is very slowly turning into another direction, but it's going to take some time for organizations to make uh, the changes that NIST and others are, are recommend, recommending. But this is what we used to see. Um, you know, you would go to type a password in and it has to be seven characters. Uh, you haven't used it in the last 24 times. Um, in the last day, doesn't contain your name or all sorts of things. You know, you have to stand on one leg while you're typing it. All, all these sorts of things that we had to do uh, with passwords. And it's incredibly frustrating. Uh, still to this day, I go into various sites and I try to create a password uh, using a password manager, which again, we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and, and some sites won't let me, they won't let me generate um, a, you know, 40 character password they'll only let me generate a eight to ten character password um, so there's got to be some changes made and, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit 
the challenge was is with all of those regulations or, or recommendations that were put in place by organizations that people became very lazy uh, with, with their passwords. They would, they would comply with what the regulation says or the policy, password policy of your organization says. It has to have uppercase, lowercase, a special character, and it has to change every you know, X amount of time depending on your organization. So as we know, people would, you know, put special characters into their words. So they would use the word password and put the, uh, you know, the at symbol and they would change the zero to a, or the O to a zero. But then what they would do, a lot of people is they would, you know, say, okay, well, I need to change it every 90 days or, or every month. I, I need to remember what that password is. So they would just add something to the end. And as we can see here, it would go from, you know, the word password with some characters changed around. And by the way, that doesn't stop anybody because, you know, hackers and people that work in the industry know that people do this. It's human behavior. So they, they build in algorithms to look, you know, for those, uh, those changes. But then what users would do is put, put, you know, the month and the year on the end of their password, you know, January 2018, and they would progress forward. The struggle or the, the challenge with this is that if you can figure out somebody's pattern of how they're doing their password, you know, maybe they've been involved in a data breach or whatnot, and you can see a pattern of passwords. If they've continued to use that pattern and you know what month it is, uh, chances are you can get into their account. So again, the, the old NIST standards actually, um, you know, created, um, you know, while there was some good regulations and good policies um, behind what the way that they were recommending, it actually um, it made things somewhat worse. So, so NIST has now come out with uh, special application 863B, whereas the other one was 63A. Uh, I kind of uh, chuckle a little bit because I find NIST's naming convention is very similar to people's <laughs> password convention. They just changed one letter at the end. Um, but the changes here is there, there's pretty much three main changes with this new special publication and this came out in 2017. you know the 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 best one i think is removing the periodic change requirements um, and this is one that obviously a lot of corporate employees that are forced to create a new password every month you know are going to be happy about um, you know uh, people don't want want to change every month. They can't remember what they used last month or, or whatnot. Um, and there's been multiple studies that have been done that have shown that requiring those frequent password changes um, is actually counterproductive to good password security. But everybody is holding on to that thought that we need to do this. So um, the thought is, is that not requiring people to change the password as often will, will change that. The other thing that NIST is recommending is to drop the complexity. You know, I always tell people you don't need any more to do a Vulcan death grip on your keyboard, you know, with all your fingers all at the same time. Um, so the password complexity requirements uh, that, need, you know, that we saw before that need uppercase, lowercase, all those sorts of things, NIST is now saying we don't need that anymore. Um, you know, it's better to actually have longer passwords, um, but something that you'll remember rather than, you know, maybe just an eight character complex password that you won't remember and you'll just put something at the end of it so you can remember. The other thing that NIST is recommending is uh, they're, they're suggesting that the screening of new passwords against lists of commonly used passwords, you know, such as the one I showed you before with, you know, passwords or one, two, three, four, five. Obviously, if you went to create a new password, it would be flagged for no, you can't use this because it's a commonly used password. Or the other thing that they're, um, they're suggesting now is to uh, screen new passwords against uh, passwords that have been compromised. Um, out there from data breaches and, and using different sets. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, so this is one of the best ways to, to um, you know, strengthen uh, your, your passwords is to screen them against, you know, the lists of, of dictionary passwords or known compromised passwords. So just to show you an example of, of you know, password complexity and, and, you know, how people think about their passwords, you know, the first example here is what you know, back in 2003, NIST was suggesting, you know, this is actually a nine, uh, nine character. So it meets that eight character minimum. It's got uppercase, lowercase, some special, you know, characters thrown into the mix a little bit. Um, so it, me it meets that standard. Um, and everybody would look at that one and go, well, yeah, 
that's that's pretty secure, right? It meets everything there versus the the lower password. You know, I like to eat hamburgers for lunch, right? Um, and you think about your average user, which one of these might they remember um, better, <laughs> right? Um, I would think probably the second one. Um, and I like to eat password or hamburgers for lunch also has the spaces in in that phrase. So what NIST is now recommending is use use a phrase, use um, a bunch of words that you know, put some spaces in between, but make it longer. So you know there's there's different websites out there that you can go and you can test the security or, or how secure is your password and one of them is you know how secure is my password uh, dot net and when you run both of these passwords through there you can see that the first one would take on average about four weeks for somebody to to crack and, and figure out and the second password um, takes much longer <laughs> as you can see uh, i don't think any of us have that amount of time to be uh to be trying to to crack a password so just looking at this, you, you can see that your average user is gonna be able to remember a phrase as something that's personal to them um, or, or some words that they know rather than trying to comply with these, these other standards that we have that, that was just much more complex and it actually created bad uh, you know, password management for everybody. So as I mentioned before, the other thing that NIST suggested is that uh, we start looking at newly created passwords or passwords that, you know, as an organization that uh, our, our users are wanting to create and, and look at them, you know, from, from past passwords, um, you know, ones that are on lists of the most commonly used passwords, or also looking at those passwords and if they've been involved in any data breaches in the past. Um, and there are a variety of different sites out there. We're gonna talk about two today. Uh, one is, you know, have I been pwned? And this is a site that's been around for, for some time. It's a fantastic site. Um, you know, you can go and type your email address into this account and you can see actually if, if your email has been passed or um, has been involved in a breach. Um, which is important because if you, you know, have an old email account and it's been breached and you haven't changed that password in some time, then that tells you you might want to change your password. Now, have I been pwned doesn't tell you the password. Uh, we're going to show you another site a little bit later that does. But at least now um, organizations are starting to use some of these data sets um, or these, these databases to check their users and to see if there's any um, indications of, of breach. Also, Firefox is now hooking up with Have I Been Pwned um, to actually run a lot of this for you. Um, you know, whether or not you're using a online service that's been hacked um, or, or whatnot. So um, there's some integration happening now with some of the tools that we use daily, you know, browsers and whatnot are starting to build some of these tools in, uh, which is really great for your average user, you know, before they go to a site they can see you know has it been um you know breached in the past is my information on you know in, involved in that breach uh, um so if you haven't checked out this site um, i highly recommend that you go and, and type in you know all the different um the email addresses that you use to see if it's been involved in any any breach so today i want to dive a little bit deeper into you know default passwords you know currently uh, we, we use passwords everywhere on all of the devices that we have um, within our workplace and whatnot. So we're going to talk a little bit about today about default passwords and the need to change them. Uh, we're going to talk about how criminals are using breach data. They're using those data sets uh, such as how I've been pwned and, and others um, and how they're using our emails and passwords to find our personal information and they can then take that personal information information and craft uh, much more targeted phishing attacks and things like that towards our organizations. And then we'll talk about some steps to, to mitigate those risks a little bit. So in October of 2016, uh, there was an attack on DIN. And DIN, in essence, is a, for those of you that don't know, it's in essence a routing station for all, you know, a lot of internet traffic. You know, I think about back, uh, you know, the, the old movies, we're used to see, you know, a phone call coming in and somebody would answer it and they take a cable out of one, you know, slot and they put in another slot and, and they, you know, crank a little wheel and off your call went somewhere else. Um, you know, DIN in essence is, is somewhat similar to that. It's routing all your internet traffic all over the world. And in October 2006, 
2016, uh, there was a DDoS attack on, on DIN. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a DDoS attack is a denial of service attack. And, you know, in essence, what happened here was that, um, you know, the DIN infrastructure was completely uh, overloaded with, with um, you know, uh, requests to, to it and, it and it shut it down. Um, the, the trouble here is that it shut down a lot of the other sites that you know used in right that, that the traffic flows through so i'm, I'm going to read off here a few of the services that uh, were affected by this and i want to you know see if you know of any of these so um some of the services that were affected by this attack were airbnb amazon boston globe cnn fox news netflix new york times paypal spotify twitter and more so you know obviously all of you know all of those um you know what happened here is that there were uh there was um you know malware installed on millions of iot devices uh, i think most of the majority of them were uh, cameras and systems like that and what the attackers were able to do here is that they had the default usernames and passwords for all of these devices so they were able to go in and and create a botnet and then use that botnet to launch a ddos attack against din now the scary thing about an attack such as this is you know everybody says okay well you know din got shut down for a little while but if you you know potentially you go to um you know buy something on amazon and you see that amazon is down you're like oh, okay that that's very strange uh let me go check the news and you see that the news is down okay and you go to twitter because a lot of us get our news from twitter um and it's down you start checking all these sites where you find out information about something and they're all down at the same time so an attack on on a place like DIN also affected the way that we communicate with each other and it shut down those forms of communication. Um, so luckily it didn't last that long, um, but we're starting to see in the industry that there is the potential for much larger attacks such as this using all of these IoT devices that we love to buy, um, but we don't change the username, uh, default username and passwords on them. So, you know, this isn't anything that you have to go on to the deep or dark web to find these default uh, passwords. There are sites out there such as Open Says Me, uh, as you can see here on the screen, that has, you know, thousands of these de uh, default passwords for thousands of systems all over the place. And, and you can scroll down and you can see, you know, click on any single one of them. So here is just an example of, of Symantec. I just picked one. Um, I'm, not, I'm not picking on Symantec at all, but you can see here that uh, there's a whole bunch of products listed here, including firewall, appliances, antivirus, uh, whatnot. Um, and you can actually see there's the default username and the, and the default password as well. So it's incredibly important, even though you know we still have to use passwords in this day and age, it's incredibly important that if you do get a device or you get something, um, and IoT devices are, are particularly um, important for this, that you change the default username and password so somebody else doesn't you know inadvertently take control of that device without you knowing about it. So let's talk a little bit about breach data and how um, you know criminals and others are using breach data um, against us. So just a few little notes here about passwords, and you can see it at the bottom there. I've actually given the reference of where I got this from, but the average business user um, has about 191 different passwords that they use. Um, I think that's probably about average, about what I've got, maybe maybe a, few, a little bit more, but um, on average, you know, we all use different services, we all use different, um, different things to log in, passwords to log in, and for years, we've been saying to everybody, you know, you need to have different passwords for different accounts don't have one password for everything so I like to see this number um, you know I like to see that these numbers are, are significantly high um, I give a lot of presentations and I talk to people and I sort of you know I'll, I'll, I'll get people in the room to raise their hand and I'll start rhyming out you know how many people have you know 10 passwords that across sites and you get some people in the room raise their hands so I like to see people using a variety of different passwords for different sites the average 250 employee company has about, you know, just over 47,000 passwords in use uh, for the company itself. Uh, so that's a lot of password management 
that has to be going on. And, you know, as we've seen over the last, you know, few years, the attack vector for a lot of these breaches has changed a little bit. Um, you know, it used to be, uh, you know, some time ago, and it still does happen, obviously, that that attackers would go after, you know, the, the infrastructure of an organization and try to, you know, hack their way through their firewall and do all sorts of things. Well, you know, now attackers know that, you know, the weakest link with an organization is oftentimes its employees, right? They're, they're sharing, um, you know, information or they're creating you know weak passwords that you know the name of their dog that they've also got up on facebook and, and things like that and they're all also more willing or, or more you know open to clicking on links and we all know about ransomware and attacks and such so you know this is a lot of management that organizations need to consider uh, the study also said that 61% of people um, use the same or similar password everywhere, despite knowing that it's not a secure practice. So again, that, that um, that's pretty scary, right? Again, um, you know, that doesn't really, you know, you look at the first stat and this stat, and, and I sort of wonder about the numbers a little bit, but, um, you know, again, uh, you shouldn't be using your same password everywhere. So I like to do, you know, the opposite. I recommend the opposite of recycling. Um, you know, here's the re reuse, reduce, recycle for the, for the green movement. And um, I like to recommend when it comes to passwords that you actually do the complete opposite to this. Um, you know, don't reuse. Uh, your passwords um, and other places don't reduce them have more and obviously don't recycle them obviously don't you know just add a, a another number to the end of a password that you've already used one thing that we've been seeing in the last uh, few months probably over the last uh, not even six months is we've had calls from a, a lot of our clients and other people that have been very concerned about an email that they had recently received. And, you know, this email was a variant of a, you know, uh, an extortion or, you know, other people call it sex extortion scam uh, that's been going around for some time. Uh, for years, uh, um, you know, I've received them and I'm sure you have as well emails that says, hey, I've, you know, installed something on your system and I've been remote accessing or looking at what you've been looking at and, and you know, shame on you, you've been looking at some very bad things and I'm going to share your internet history uh, with the world unless you pay me some money. This uh, email that people have received that we, we started to see a few months ago is very similar to that. But the interesting thing about this one, you can see, and I've redacted, you know, some of the uh, things here, is um, the recipient's username and password was included within the, you know, the subject of the email. You know, you can see at the top there it was sent to somebody, and um, the subject was your username and your password. Um, and adding that password really personalized that email to you. Right, which you know obviously will increase the chance that people you know think that it's real and that they will fall for the scam. We had many, many people calls and say they've got a password of mine. It, this is me. This must be real. Um, you know, and the first uh, you know person that called us um, told us that this is a password that uh, that he still uses. Right, so he was very concerned about that. Whereas somebody else that called us said that they haven't used that password in years. Um, so we did a little bit of research into this particular scam and it looks as though that a lot of the passwords that were contained in these emails are quite old. They're up to 10 years old. Um, so the most likely explanation is that the perpetrators behind these scams have gathered, you know, email addresses, usernames and passwords of the victims from older data breaches and then have set up, you know, automated tools to email everybody out with those. Um, but again, we had a lot of people that were very, very concerned with that. So, you know, the point here is that, you know, uh, criminals are using our passwords against us. Um, and it was particularly scary in this one where the one person that we were speaking to says that he's been using that same password for potentially 10 years. Um, that That's quite scary. Um, so the other site where a lot of these passwords are shown is, is one called Dehash, and, and we like to use this all the time. It's very similar to Have I Been Pwned, but the difference with Dehash is that well, it will actually, if possible, show you the password itself, uh, which, which is pretty interesting. So for example, um, some of the passwords in Dehash um, are hashed. 
right? You can see there at the bottom, I've redacted obviously the, the email account, but um, you, you, can, you can see there that um, you know, it's a hashed password. Now, what you can then do is you can take that hashed, hashed password and you can search it through uh, data sets as well and see if other people are using it. And if you get you know, a whole bunch of people using you know, this hashed password, chances are it's probably a commonly used password like we saw before. So you might be able to guess it or you might be able to create a dictionary attack of commonly used passwords and try it on this account. As you can see here with, with other ones, um, and, and this depends on the organization that was breached and obviously how they stored their passwords, but you can see in some of them, it's just plain text right right there. So, um, you know, obviously that's not a very strong, strong password, but uh, regardless, there's a lot of plain text passwords on this site. So what I did is um, I was giving a presentation a little while ago and I was speaking with somebody that, that works at, at a company. So I decided to run their company and, and I redacted the, the company name at the top. Um, and I found that there were 1100, just over 1100 uh, listings um, for this company in Dehashed. And some of them were um, you know, involved in different data breaches. So some of them were hashed passwords and some of them were not. Uh, so you can see, for example, here, one of the employees from that company um, actually used his password was password, um, which goes back to that very first slide of showing the uh, the worst passwords that we can use. So obviously this person, uh, and this was a corporate email account, um, obviously this person needs to be you know, uh, educated on, on stronger password strength. Um, but the challenge here is that criminals can then use this to try to find maybe your personal email accounts or whatnot. So there's a tool that we like to use in our investigations called, called Read Notify, and, and you can um, install trackers on emails and whatnot, and you can try to get somebody's IP address. So what I did in this sort of situation is I, I um, you know, you know, and this person was was playing along with me. But I went and I emailed that person from that organization and I installed a, a renotify tracker and I got their IP address. Um, perfect. And then I went back on uh, Dehashed and I ran that person's name uh, just through Dehashed itself. And it came up with a whole listing of non-corporate accounts. So what I started doing is um, just emailing some of those corporate or non-corporate accounts, as you can see here, um, and they were founded in various um, data breaches and i also put a, a read notify tracker on those uh, communications as well and lo and behold with one of them i got the same ip address from it from a tracker so i was able to um figure out you know from from a corporate email account i was able to figure out the person's personal email account and as you can see here with some of these tools you get you know a, a date and time and ip P address and you also get what they're using um, and some other things as well. So it can be pretty handy some of these tools. But then what I did is I took and this is a different example, but I took, um, you know, their their personal email account and I actually went out on the web and I started searching up information based on their personal email account. Um, and you can see here that I was very quickly able to figure out their mobile phone number and then on the other screen, uh, their their personal address where they lived. Um, so again, this can be pretty scary, right? Um, so criminals can, can do this quite easy and, and they can, you know, then use this information, you know, so now they've got your email account, they've got maybe an old password of yours, they've got your, your phone number, they've got your address, they figured out some personal information about you and they can use that to, to you know, create other, other attacks, you know, um, against your organization or, or against you. So, you know, I want to go into now changes that I think should be made to the current landscape. Um, so, you know, one thing is using password managers of, of some sort, and I, and I do get a lot of people that use them um, in organizations and, and personally as well, but I was at a presentation yesterday and I think one person in the room put up their hand and said, I actually use a password manager. So we recommend using some sort of password manager and obviously do your research ahead of time to which one you feel is, is best for you. Um, but the benefits to this is that this manager will keep all your passwords for you. You'll have to remember, you know, one password to get into whatever tool you use. So make it a very strong pa password, very lengthy. Um, but then it can also create passwords for you. So you can see here, um, as an example, you can have these tools generate you a very long, in this case, 50 character, um, you know, using digits and symbols, uh, password that you can then use and 
you know, I don't know about you, but um, I would never be able to remember that password ever. Um, so, but I don't need to, right? I've got my password manager that I can use and it creates these passwords for me. And I just need that one password that I know how to get into the manager. So if you're not using a password manager, please do um, in, within your organization and also, um, you know, personally as well. It's very, very important. So the other thing is we, we see now a lot of people are just dealing with one factor authentication. They're just using passwords in order to get into their accounts. And what we've been suggesting, obviously, for some time, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, is using two factor authentication. So obviously, the first factor is something, you know, which is a password. And the second factor is something you have, which is a you know one-time password token or some sort of application that you can use to get that one-time password. Um, I'm sure uh, a lot of you are now shuddering uh, right now and, and uh, screaming at the screen because you remember these dongles that were lying around um, that used to get stolen or you know people would walk along and press the button and you'd be locked out. But um, these used to be around quite a lot. And I remember using these back in the day where it would create that one-time password for you um, and you would have to guard this with your life so it, it didn't change um, or put it in a very safe place. Um, so however, like, like I said, they used to be stolen and whatnot and, and people would mess around with them. So you know what we've now switched to is using other types of technology. We don't have to carry a little token with us anymore. So there are sites out there now. This is a great site that I that I recommend where you can go and you can take a look at all the different places that you can set up two-factor authentication and, and we suggest you know that you set it up everywhere <laughs> that you can especially places that have you know um you know any personal information or banking or finance or anything like that um or information that somebody can get about you um, it's, it's very very important so, um, however, there are different ways now that we can get these two-factor codes. And, and one common way is that people will um, get a, a text message or an SMS message or whatnot to their mobile phone. And while that's great, um, there, there is, you know, malware and, and things that can be um, put on your mobile phone that can actually, you know, see your, your SMS messages. Um, so if you're getting... You know your two-factor code sent by that and you may not know that you got malware on your phone you may inadvertently be giving a uh, two-factor code to somebody who's you know maybe got your password and your and your two-factor code now so you know what we recommend is using some other tools um, that don't rely on sms um, authy is one and google authenticator is another that help you generate those codes so this is where we think everybody should be now is at least using a password and, and two-factor um, authentication using some other method. So, you know, people have said the password is dead, long live the what, right? Um, you know, I, I don't believe passwords are going to go away anytime soon. They're going to be around for a little bit longer, but there's a lot more that we could be doing, um, you know, to increase the security of just using a password. You know, passwords were not meant to, you know, be, uh, you know, a fortress, right? They weren't meant to lock people out, you know, sort of at, at a minimum, they were meant to just be a, you know, a slight deterrence on, on things. Um, you know, if you create a very strong password, obviously that, that can help. But, you know, as we've seen over the years, passwords have been, for the most part, fairly weak. People are setting weak passwords. So it, it's just, like I said, a, a very a minor deterrence, um, as we can see here in the right picture, that people will just just walk right past. So they're obviously not meant for, you know, strong security. So, you know, we can somewhat cross out here, you know, something, you know, your password and something you have, you know, your, your, um, your other two factor code, if it, if you're using it on your SMS phone, or you're still using one of those old devices that somebody could steal. So, you know, so what's next, what's next on the horizon? Well, we're already seeing something you are, um, you know, biometrics, um, iris scans, uh, voice, facial recognition. Um, that's just another, you know, third factor of authentication that we can then use. However, there are methods around this. Here's a little video uh, showing somebody getting past the, um, you know, fingerprint scan on an iPhone. And uh, they, they put their finger in here and you'll see in a second how they just make a little mold and they use it, they can get right past the phone. Um, so I have uh, colleagues from my ex-law enforcement days that are fingerprints experts and they say, yeah, this sort of stuff is not, not very challenging to, to get around. Um, so you can see there they are, they're in. So very, very simple. And then, you know, we talk about uh, facial recognition or voice recognition. You know, here's a video that I saw on the web a little while ago. Let's see if it plays here.
more vigilant with what we trust on the internet. So, you know, the point here wasn't trusting on the internet, but the, the, the sort of the point I was trying to make here is that, you know, our voice, you know, recognition could be bypassed and obviously facial recognition. There's other articles out there about, you know, masks that people have made that are getting past, you know, the facial recognition on phones um, or, you know, twins. Right? We've had some situations where where that has happened as well. So obviously there's there's some improvement that could be made there as well. Um, but, you know, there are there are weaknesses in in that type of uh, authentication as well so you know let's say we cross that one out what's what's next on the horizon so somewhere uh somewhere you are you know based on you know the ip address of, of your location or your mac address of maybe the um you know your bss id of the system you're connecting to from your network your geolocation based on your phone things like that right so we can work in where you are well, obviously, you know, IP spoofing, uh, you know, has, has been around for some time. Um, so there's challenges with this as well. You know, um, you know MAC address. Uh, uh, okay, if we're using the, the, the GPS on our phone, you know, can that be, you know, manipulated or, or whatnot? So, you know, again, obviously, there's some room for improvement here. Um, it's just another, another fact that we can use. So again, we go into a fifth factor. So what what is the future? Where are we moving to now? So what we're seeing now is something you do, um, you know, be it a, a certain gesture that you have, be it your eye movement, right? We've seen that for a little while, the way that you would look at the screen, the way that you look at something, uh, breathing patterns, uh, things like that as well. There, there's, there's definitely opportunities here where we bake all of these things in together. Um, and this is more unique. Uh, we've talked about, I've seen heart rate variability, right? We all have somewhat unique um, heart rates and, and the, the variability of that can be used uh, for an authentication factor as well. So the gesture one is really, really interesting. Um, there is um, a Microsoft came out a little while ago and did a elevator that um, there was a gentleman at Microsoft that was getting upset and I can't remember his name right now. I apologize, but he was getting upset with people not being able to find where his office was. He was a senior executive there. Um, so he designed this, this elevator and what it would do is it would um, watch people walking up to the elevator um, and it would, it would also look at other data as well and, and their, the way that they walked and their gait and it would you know help determine which floor they would need to go to um, so we're starting to see you know uh, this technology you know be it machine learning or ai built into all of these tools that is now reading you know our gait or our gestures or our eye movement or, or things like that um, you know and this isn't for security purposes, obviously, this is more for you know convenience. It's going to take you where you want to go quicker. Um, you know, I, I don't know if walking into an elevator and it's going to take me where I go rather than me walking and just pressing a button is going to really speed things up. But you never know. Um, I, I joke that this is similar to the uh, Happy Vertical People Transporter uh, that's mentioned in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the elevators could see far enough into the future to arrive at a floor. Uh, before a potential passenger even realized that they wanted uh, a lift, right? So, um, you know, they see somebody walking towards an elevator and the elevator's already there, it's ready for you to go. Um, so interesting technology, right? And we're gonna start to see this technology also being used for security purposes, obviously built into, you know, when we log into a computer, you know, um, can it check our heart rate variability or the way that we're looking at the screen or or other things? Right. Um, and we're all going to bake this in. So, you know, as I've been going through this presentation, I've been, you know, sort of scratching off all these different um, authentication methods and sort of showing that there's some weaknesses in some of them. But obviously the best um, thing to do here is to obviously layer them um, all together and, and to have them moving as well. They're, they're all going to be, be be moving and morphing over, over the next little while. Right. As we saw, even just going back to the first authentication method with just using a password by itself, that would be one layer. Well, that's been changed over the years, right? It's not static in time. Um, the, 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 the complexity of passwords is now changing and getting stronger. So if you start to layer on some of these other factors of authentication, it's gonna make the security of you know, getting into our systems um, a lot stronger.
obviously. Now, the one concern from a lot of people that I've heard as well, okay, you, you expect us to have a five <laughs> layer authentication to get into our tools or to get into our systems. Well, maybe not, but but maybe, but the 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 challenge here for organizations and for the industry is to make some of these authentication methods uh, somewhat seamless, right? Like you look at using your fingerprint on your phone, it's somewhat seamless. You just touch your fingerprint to your phone and, and you're in. Um, so it, it's not really slowing down the user. It's not slowing down business op operations at all. So what we're, you know, we're saying in the industry is that, you know, you're still going to probably have passwords for some time. You're probably still going to have, you know, a two factor code that gets sent to you. And sometimes that people complain about that slowing them down. They have to go into their, you know, their password manager to get their password. And then they have to look on their phone or something for their two factor authentication. So we're going to start to see over time, some of these other authentication methods that are just, um, you know, built in and it's going to recognize us. Um, facial recognition is, is a great one. We just look at the screen and we type in a password and we're, and we're in. Um, so we're going to start to see layers um, um, built on top of each other of, of automatic um, authentication methods that are done. Uh, we're still going to probably have to type in some things or type in a code, uh, what, what not, but it's going to get easier over time, I think, and, and, and more secure. Um, perfect. I think that's about all I have to say, and I will hand this back over. Thank you, Ryan, for delivering this very detailed and informative presentation. Uh, I hope the audience had the chance to learn some new ways on how to secure their passwords. I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for Cybersecurity Introduction Foundation and Lead Cybersecurity Manager. A PCB certificate in these above mentioned courses will uh, convey your dedication in implementing and managing cybersecurity process, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions uh, regarding today's session. The first question is, online password checkers are secure. What if uh, they use password entered for dictionary creation? Sorry, can you repeat that? I think the line just cut out there a little bit. Uh, so it said online password checkers are secure. Uh, what if they use the password entered for dictionary creation? Online passwords uh, managers are secure. What if they use the dictionary? Creation, creation, yes. Creation. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite following the question, but um, you know, in, in relation to the security of, of password managers, there, there has been some issues in the past where some of these Password managers have have been breached, um, and obviously, you know, they 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 filled those gaps. Um, but for the most part, they're using you know encryption, um, you know, based on you know very strong encryption methods and whatnot to get into those. Um, th the question though is in relation to using dictionary words. Yeah. So we have also another question that is uh, related to password manager. So it okay. says, uh, doesn't the use of a password manager present a higher risk based on your earlier point that we inherently use weak passwords? And if that one password for the password manager gets cracked, all of my other passwords won't matter anymore. Well, that's true. That's true. So, you know, what, what I always suggest to people is, you know, I would rather have um, one strong password, you know, that I need to, um, you know, remember and but I can change when I want to um, that you know would be very challenging for somebody to to break into my password manager um, I would rather have that than have you know 191 passwords that I need to remember and and change and maybe you know have on a you know excel sheet on my computer or people put sticky notes on their computers or write them in a book um, or something like that um, I don't want to have to remember to change 191 passwords and make them all secure. Um, so from, from my viewpoint, you know, um, I can change that one password to get into my password manager whenever I want to. Um, you know, and if obviously if they've been involved in a data breach, that that's obviously very um, important to remember that. Um, but I'm going to make that password to get in as, as strong as I can. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, actually, we're getting a lot of questions for this session. Uh, let me read another one. Uh, it says, how to protect your password from artificial intelligence since it's already started being 
it's already being used by uh, hackers. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, so th this is where we're going to start to see um, the layering effect, right? If, if all you're relying upon is a password, right, and, and protecting that from people, then then you're already behind the eight ball here. Um, you know, you're, you have to use in today's world other authentication methods, and you can't just rely on one password to, to, to you know, cover everything. Um, because the, the challenge becomes is if you're not checking those breach sites to see if your information has been breached then how would you know how would you know that you need to go change that right and the example i gave where somebody sent out that that extortion email it was old you know they, they thought it was around uh data data you know information from about a 10 year old breach well the attackers are going to start to use more um you know recent breaches as they come out they're going to get that information and they're going to turn that around very very quickly so unless, you know, personally, you're going out and you're checking these sites, you know, repeatedly um, to see if you've, you know, your information has been involved in a breach, you're going to have to layer on some sort of other authentication methods. Um, yes, hackers are getting, uh, you know, better what they do. The, uh, the, the ways that they, you know, can use to, you know, uh, crack our passwords and figure out our passwords are getting stronger. Right, a lot of them will use, you know, password cracking devices, um, you know, computers, very strong computers, and they're they're getting quicker. Um, and AI is obviously, um, you know, something that's going to make that probably easier to do. So you're going to have to layer on different authentication methods. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, because of the time limitation, uh, we're sorry to say that we'll read only one more question for today's session, uh, and actually the last question is quite an interesting one. So is there any guarantee that the online password checking tools, such as the one that you mentioned, have I been pawned, are not actually collecting the information that is being entered into them? Well, the only thing you're entering into those sites is your email account. Uh, um, so, you know, they, if, if anything, that's all they would be capturing. But um, the, the person, uh, his name is Troy Hunt. You can go look him up. Um, you know, he's a very reputable person, works for a very reputable company. Um, and he, he's, he's very concerned about this. And that's why he started up this to, to inform and protect people. Now, that being said, this sort of parlays into another area. You know, you have to be very careful about what tools you use, you know, such as password managers. I always recommend that you really have to do your research. There are password managers out there, um, and the sole purpose of the developers developing them was to, you know, gather your credentials. It wasn't protecting you at all. So, you know, do your research on, you know, what tools you want to use, be it, you know, a two-factor tool or a password manager, make sure you're using reputable tools. Um, but again, the, the, the information you're typing into, have I been pwned or, or dehashed, um, you're not typing in your passwords, right? You, you, you can search for a password and dehash, but it might not be the password you use. Um, but in have I been pwned, you're just typing in your email address. Um, so it's, it's, my logic is I would rather know um, you know, if, if my information has been involved in a breach, then, then, um, you know, worry about my email address. You know, you can see my email address is here in front of you on the screen <laughs> with some of my other contact information. Um, so obviously I, I, I'm comfortable giving out my, uh, my corporate email address for, for everybody to see. So, um, then you can, on, on the screen there, you can contact me on LinkedIn if you'd like, or, you know, feel free to visit our website. We have other blog posts and information on our website about this, uh, this topic. So to, the, to add to that questions, uh, I would like to know, so can that email that have I been pawned collect from you, can that be shared potentially to a third party or you can't know that? Well, I'm not sure if they're, if they're gathering that information and, and sharing that with a third party. You mean the, the, the data itself or the email that you type in to have Actually, I been pawned? If, if you're typing data in, uh, they, they, they might share that. I'm, I'm not sure. You would probably have to contact uh, uh, Troy to, to ask that one. Um, you know, it's my understanding that, that they don't. Um, you know, when, when you go on that site as well, you're going to see recommendations on have I been honed about using password managers and ways to protect yourself, right? So he, he, he's obviously very concerned about this as well um, and making sure that people are, are as protected as they can. 
Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for this uh, absolutely great session, great and informative session, and also thank you for this very informative Q&A session. I would like to also thank the attendees for being with us today. Uh, and also let them know that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel together with the slides of the presentation. This will be sent to you within a couple of days. For more information about our webinars or anything related to PECB, you can visit our website www.pecb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.